Next, I'd, um, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Benjamin Friedman. He's known, and he likes to be called Bino. Known, he told me, he said, my friends call me Bino, so please call me Bino. Um, he was trained as a, cannot see with my glasses on. He was trained as a stem cell scientist at Berkeley and Harvard. He's inspired by his uncle who suffered from kidney disease. Bino was one of the first people in the world to grow human kidney tissue from stem cells. He is currently an associate professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and Bino says his dream is to grow new kidneys from our own cells. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, really, I do feel that we are all friends here, and I, I, I personally really enjoy this meeting. It's a family conference. You know, I'm a parent, and I can relate, and, 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 and everybody here just inspires me so much. So it is a great interaction between, between us as researchers and, and you as, as patients and families. And that's just, whenever I, I, I come, I always come back so inspired, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about regenerating kidney tissue uh, in the context of nephropathic cystinosis, and I think Dr. Grimm set, set this talk up very nicely, and I totally agree. I mean, I think we, we are living in an age of medical miracles, and this is just a couple of days ago, the patient, uh, Rick Slayman, who received this gene-edited pig kidney, left the hospital off dialysis. So, we do have good reason for hope. This is a day of hope. And we do want to be in it for the long term and keep that hope alive. That technology, Xenograft, it also has its limitations. So before you call up the local convenience store and ask them for the, the pig kidney, uh, Bear in mind that this is a transplant from another species, and the body will vigorously try to reject it, much more than a human kidney. And uh, these are results from monkey studies where over time, uh, you can see the, as, as the kidneys become more and more gene edited to make them more tolerated, they, are, they do last much longer in monkeys, uh, but they still don't last long enough where we would consider this to be uh, a very good transplant. And for the reasons that Dr. Grimm just explained, uh, the system is very risk averse, particularly for, for young people. So for all of you in the audience, you know, you're thinking about your kids, you're going to want the best possible transplant for the child, right? And it's not going to be from a monkey. Uh, there's also some other considerations. You know, it, it, they, these would require strong immunosuppression. They would be eventually rejected. Uh, the size and function of the kidney is not the same. In fact, those are, people don't really talk about this, but these are mini pigs that are being used for transplant. Uh, so it's not exactly the pig that we think about when we're, uh, you know, eating breakfast. And <laughs> there's uh, also potential for zoonotic infection. So I think in general that this is a very exciting finding. I'm super excited about it personally. Uh, but for now, it's going to be limited to humane use cases, right? I'm going to talk about another technology, which is sort of a miracle in and of itself, which is called human pluripotent stem cells. And uh, this technology gives us, for the first time, the ability to grow new tissue from our bodies for organs that normally would only form during embryonic development. Uh, it starts with uh, culturing cells from our body. These are adult cells, even if they come from kids. They're still adult in the cellular sense. They're from uh, you know, a full-grown organism and not an embryo. But by introducing into those cells genes that are normally only expressed during embryonic development, they are reprogrammed into stem cells. And these stem cells are very powerful. They represent the earliest stages in fact, you could envision growing an entire human being from this stem cell. Uh, these cells are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPS cells, and we then differentiate these, or change these, into different types of organs, and we're particularly interested in the kidneys, and they form these little organoid structures in culture. 
And we can use those to study disease, to ask questions about how cystinosis works, for instance, or what drugs might work for cystinosis. But we can also envision a future where we transplant those structures back into a patient. And in that context, they would be 100% immunocompatible. And these could be produced on demand. So just like the xenografts, iPS cells have advantages, but they also have some limitations. And in fact, they're sort of the yin-yang, I think, to that xenograft technology. So the opposite of xenograft, which is coming from a totally different species, these iPS cells can be made from our own cells. So they would be 100% immunocompatible. We can also grow them forever. So you, there's the potential to grow a lot of these structures, and we can scale it up very readily just because the, the property of those stem cells. So they wouldn't require immunosuppression. They would never be rejected. It would be a game changer as a modality. It would be a fundamentally different modality, I think, from the existing transplant. But there's still a lot of development work, and it's much earlier in stage compared to those xenografts in terms of the clinic. So we, the biggest problem is that we can't grow whole organs from these cells. They're starting off as just cells in a plate, and we have no way to generate an entire structure that could be functional. And furthermore, we need to do a lot more work to test these in transplant in animals before we can even think of putting them into a person. So we need to prove that it actually works. So let's think for a second about how it could work. If we can't grow a whole organ, what can we do? And what could be beneficial for cystinosis specifically? So the, the, the pathophysiology of cystinosis is that it is, the nephropathic cystinosis is caused by cell loss. And this has been introduced already by previous speakers. So we start with cysteine overload in the cells of the kidney. And this really dramatically affects those, those tubular cells, those proximal tubular cells. That's why the Fanconi syndrome comes up. And in the beginning, there's dysfunction, but there's also loss of those cells over time. And that's fundamental as a turning point for the disorder. And then over time, that affects the entire kidney, and there's also loss of the filter units, as we just heard about, those glomeruli. And ultimately, that results in very uh, premature kidney failure. And this is a picture from one of Dr. Shirky's uh, review papers, where you can see this loss of the tubular cells down here at the bottom at, over time. And this, contracts the whole nephron and leads to what's called a swan neck extension of the nephron. So the IPS cell technology could fit in by adding back cells that are being lost to compensate for that problem. And uh, well, the way this would work, we wouldn't want to put in the, the, the IPS cells in their initial state because those could turn into anything, but rather we would want to change them into progenitor cells first, things that are specific to the kidneys, and they're almost, they're almost a nephron, but not quite there yet. And then we'd want to inject them into the kidneys and let them form new nephrons in the kidney and link up to the existing system. And in this way, you could potentially augment the number of nephrons that are in your kidney. That's, the, that's my plan. That's the thought that I think could work. So how are we doing this? How are we going about it? Well, we're creating iPS cells from people with cystinosis. And uh, the, the way this works is we start with those urinary cells. Uh, we have a kit, and people provide a urine sample. This is a first void, typically. We ask them to add a preservative solution to the urinary the urine sample that keeps the cells that are actually being shed into the urine all the time, keeps them healthy enough to last until we can get them back to the lab. And these then grow out as urinary cells, and they can grow quite a bit. And during that time, while they're growing, we change them into iPS cells. So then they can actually last forever and become 
more complex structures than just the urinary cells. And doing this, we're creating a biobank of cystinosis IPS cells. And uh, I call this the CRF collection, because it's really the CRF and this wonderful foundation that has sponsored all of this work. And uh, uh, th this then results in, in cystinosis IPS cells, as well as we do collect on occasion IPS cells from people without cystinosis, just so we have a control. And many of you in the room have contributed to this study. So uh, you can see a, a brief listing here of some of these features of the different cell lines that we've made from different patients. And we have uh, about 17 IPS cell lines from different individuals. Well, 17, we have IPS cell lines, we have multiple IPS cell lines from each patient. We have those from 17 individuals. Uh, we are looking for more, and uh, Dr. Spinati in my lab uh, is here today, and she's going to be helping me man a table where we will collect uh, samples from those who are interested. And you may remember Dr. Johnlin, who came last year to the same event, and uh, she's also involved in this project. So this is something we can talk about during the questions time as well, and I hope you'll ask me questions, even in front of the whole group, about how this works, so that we don't have to all think it through at the last moment. And uh, to, to facilitate that, I put together this slide, and th this is the opportunities that we have to contribute to our biobank. You can do this here at the conference. You'll also have opportunities to do it later. So don't feel like this is the last chance. And in fact, we can only process a certain number of these every time. Um, but we can sign you up if you don't get the chance to do it today. Uh, we will want to collect a completed consent form. We have to get your permission. And uh, if it's a child who's less than 18, we're going to ask for the parent's permission as well. Uh, we also want a completed questionnaire. So that's going to have details about the person's condition. These forms will take some time to complete, so bear that in mind. Uh, and we want a urine sample, which we'll ask you to prepare and add preservative to. And then uh, the way this is going to work is that we'll have a table this afternoon. You can check in with us. Now, if you've already done this and we've got cells made from you, then we're going to say, thank you very much. Go enjoy the spa. Okay, and we don't need more cells. But some people have signed up and tried it before, but it hasn't worked. And for those individuals, uh, we will make sure that we have all the forms, the consent and questionnaire, or if you're a new individual, and then we'll ask you to do this again, to give us another urine sample so we can try it again. And that will be done overnight, so you can collect it in the privacy of your hotel room as convenient overnight, add the preservative solution, and then please, if you're going to do it, we'll ask that you drop off all the materials to us by 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. Because we are going to have to get packed up, go to the lab, and process these the same day to have the best possible outcome. And there will be a refrigerator set up where you can drop off your sample kit. So. Now let's talk about what we can do with these stem cells after we make them. And uh, as we've heard, we can now change IPS cells into kidney structures. And these are called kidney organoids. And the organoids take about 20 days to form. You can see a movie of this here on the right. It's quite a, a remarkable process. The cells form these clusters, which are actually very similar to how nephrons form. And when you look at these clusters, they have the types of cells that are normally in nephron. So they've got the, the podocytes, which are the filtering cells of the kidney. And these form these tight balls that are very similar to like glomeruli in the, in, in, in the kidney. And then there's these proximal tubular cells here, shown in green, that are connected to the podocytes. And then there's a, a, a sort of medulla of the kidney organoid inside, where these proximal tubules give way to distal tubules. And this really resembles what's present in the organ in terms of the number of cells, in terms of their distal to proximal arrangements. Uh, but it's not a perfect replica. Of course, the body 
makes a much better tissue when the cells are grown in that context than when they're grown outside of the body. So when we started, we didn't know what would happen with cystinotic iPS cells. Would they even be able to turn into kidney? Turns out they are just fine. In fact, the stem cells can proliferate very well, and we don't see any defects in their normal ability to grow for long periods of time, many, many passages. And similarly, they turn into kidney organoids that appear to be just fine in terms of their composition, in terms of the number of cells, even in terms of the transporter expression. So having cystinosis does not prevent the iPS cell from changing into kidney. And that makes sense because in our bodies, even if you have cystinosis, you still form a kidney when you're in your duo. And it's also good news for us because it means that the, the strategy is not fatally flawed, right? If they couldn't grow, then we would have no hope of making anything useful out of them. What we found, though, is that if you add cysteine to the cultures and you overload these cells that have cystinosis with cysteine, so that they accumulate cysteine. They, they take in enormous amounts of cysteine, so 150 times what controls can take in. And they accumulate that inside of them to clinically relevant and clinically dangerous levels of cysteine. And this has an impact on the cells. This makes the cells sick and they don't survive. So this is cystinosis in a Petri dish. You know, we see that the cystinosis cells are getting sick when they're exposed to this environment where cysteine is present. And you need to have both. You need to have the deficiency in the gene, but also that environment that's overloading them with cysteine. If you do this in the kidney organoids, we see similarly a deterioration that's specific to the cystinosis organoids and not the controls. And this is a deterioration that you can see by phase contrast microscopy and also when you look at the different types of cells that are in these organoids. So this is exciting for drug development because we can now use this system to ask which compounds could we add to these sick organoids to prevent them from getting sick or maybe even to make them better after they've gotten sick. How can we model cystinosis therapy in these tiny little structures which we can grow you know, many and many of and are, are much faster and cheaper than to do these experiments in, in individual animals. And as we know, the animals, there's not always a great uh, response to cystinosis. They respond differently from humans. These structures are human. So if we find something that works in the organoids, at least there's a hope that it could also work in people. Now, going back to the implantation idea, uh, we've got a wonderful graduate student in the lab named Thomas Vincent, and he's been working on getting the kidney structures to form from iPS cells in a living organism. And uh, the way he does this is exactly as I explained before. We take iPS cells, we, we change them into progenitors of the kidney, and then we inject them into the kidneys of a host mouse. And this is a special type of host mouse that doesn't have an immune system. And that's important because otherwise the cells would not be tolerated by the mouse. The mouse would reject it. In fact, even if you give the mouse a very strong dose of immunosuppressive drugs, they will not grow human cells inside of them. But this mouse is essentially like a bubble boy. It's got a very severe immunodeficiency and it tolerates human cells and human grafts. And then the question is, can these form new nephrons? And the answer is yes. Uh, what happens in this context is quite remarkable. We see that the, the, the human cells that are, in this case, slipped right next to the mouse kidney, but not quite inside it yet, but just next to the mouse kidney, these grafts, the kidney cells, recruit in blood vessels from the mouse and these then invade those balls of filtering cells, those balls of podocytes that I talked about before, 
and turn them into actual glomeruli. So the, the human podocytes here in red are wrapping around these mouse blood vessels and forming a filtration unit, which is the beginning of a functional piece of kidney tissue. And these are just additional images. You can appreciate how close these structures actually look to real glomeruli. In addition to having the podocytes here surrounding the blood vessels, there are also a Bowman's capsule of cells around them. And in some cases, these are expanded, which suggests that fluid is actually passing through. So processes occur almost miraculously in the context of a living animal that we never see in a, in a Petri dish. This level of maturation doesn't normally happen unless it's inside a living organism, which I think is also promising for the therapeutic approach. One of the, so all those, all those experiments are done with, with regular immunodeficient mice. They don't have cystinosis. But if we really want to model cystinosis therapy, if we want to use this to test whether the system can work, then we need to be doing these experiments in an animal with cystinosis. So to do that, we've recently gotten funding from the CRF to generate host mice with no immune system that have cystinosis. This took a lot of work to get to work, but it's now working, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, so these are images of a cystinosis mouse next to a control mouse. Uh, these are graphs where you can see the control versus the cystinosis, the accumulation of cysteine inside these organs. Really, very high levels of cysteine are accumulating. Dangerous in a clinical setting if they were in a human being. And these animals can grow and breed together. So they are actually doing okay. And that means that we can make many of them. And we have many different strains now of cystinosis immunodeficient mice. We're characterizing these. We don't know yet how severe the cystinosis is going to be. And then we're implanting, we're planning on implanting the human grafts, hopefully in the next few months for the first time. And then we'll be able to test whether those grafts help the animals or not. So in conclusion, a humble urine sample can be the start of something, maybe even something big. Uh, we're hoping that we can start building a new paradigm away from the existing paradigm of allografts with immunosuppression towards an autograft using pluripotent stem cells from our own bodies. We've shown that iPS cells and organoids can show signs of cystinosis, and other groups have as well. So I think there's encouraging signs now to, that we can use this as a disease model. And iPS cells can form new kidney tissue after transplant. And finally, these cystinosis host mice are another new resource for the field, and we hope to be able to share these that we can use to study different types of effects on uh, implanting cells in different tissues. So I just want to thank everybody who's in the lab. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Barshop, who's here as an essential collaborator for doing the cysteine accumulation assays, as well as uh, all of you and the many families who have donated cells, and finally, the, the CRF. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. We have time for just a quick question. Do we have any questions? Hi, Bino. <laughs> um, theoretically, at what point uh, do you, would you inject uh, the iPS cells into a kidney? So would it be uh, when someone was close to ki their kidney functions has decreased dramatically, or is it something that could be done in an earlier stage to prevent that or to impact Fanconi? You know, I, I guess my initial inclination would be to say you want to do it as early as possible, right? Because you could potentially prevent the effects very early. You can envision injecting such things in utero. I mean, you don't even have to wait till a person is born if you know that they're going to have cystinosis. Um, but the beauty of the system is that you can also do it as needed because these are going to be your own cells. You know, there's not a heightened risk of rejection by having 
you know, repeat injections. So you could, you could look at how a person is doing. If they needed a shot, you could give them a shot and hopefully grow new nephrons any point in their life. Okay, thank you, Bino. Thank you.